subscribe and leave a present. A play diet video review. Sit back and enjoy the show. to another Lemon Amiga play guide and review. This time we'll be checking out Top Gear 2 AJ, developed by Gremlin Graphics and published by Gremlin Interactive in 1994. On the title screen we get some really great music and some options as well, and I'm not quite sure, continue race game and you can check out 1P mode as well, this was created by Mike Chiltern, at least converted, the code was converted from the consoles and you can see some other controls and I definitely recommend for this the music and also not amateur mode because that's too easy and unfortunately I'm selecting that for this review. that out of the way we can move to race and now we get even more options and from here we can enter our name. You might be missing some of the benefits that stereo can provide. Having done all of that it's a pity that all of these options weren't on the same options menu. Now we can change our gears and for this, well this is the easiest mode so let's have manual gears and speed in miles per hour hopefully and now finally we can choose race. Our first race is in Auckland, Australasia and it's five laps, the weather is fine and it starts at 8.30 in the morning. Before we start we get the obligatory options of the shop and unfortunately we start with zero money in this game so we can check out the shop but we can do nothing about it. After some more black screens and hopefully some loading eventually the game starts and the long loading times are definitely annoying in this particular game. the AGA version of Top Gear 2 at the moment and this was also released on normal OCS version which is exactly the same except for the sky is a lot more banded as you would expect on the OCS so it looks like all they've done is change the graphics around a little bit maybe added one or two extra colours and of course with the old 20 maybe a few frames per second as well. First course you'd hopefully get as used to the game and this came with amazing poster art you can see it's meant to be a fast action racing game and it was also released on the Sega Genesis and also released as well on the Super Nintendo. As we drive around the track we'll also notice that we give some speech bubbles and some signs and some messages to our competitors and that is almost unique to this game, I haven't seen speech bubbles in these types of racing games and all the years Lemon Amiga, this review page has definitely encouraged that in their review speech bubbles but this is one of the few games that has them built in. See, we're using a four-speed gearbox automatic at the moment and we have lots of nitros, 
piled up, ready to use, and I think you might have to press the space bar for that, not quite sure. And also the top speed is 103 miles per hour, so it's best to use the nitros on a straight bit if possible. And you can see first place is also listed on the map, you can see in the corner. So as long as we catch up to first position, this is lap 4, and unfortunately we're fifth at the moment, right at the back. So the only thing you can do on this very early course without any upgrades is to use all of those turbos. And if you use all of the turbos at the very start of every race, that means you can get into first position and simply defend from there. That should hopefully mean you don't have to crash into the back of any racers, and that should hopefully mean you can stay in front for the rest of it. Now on the final lap, so let's use up the turbos, because on this very easy mode at least it gives us a full turbo recharge on every single level, or every single race, so we can burn through them and use them all up as the race continues. And we still got three left, and that's the end of it, and we managed to get in first place. And that means it will give us time as well in the top corner, not that, that means much. And then after some more loading, of which is definitely vitally unnecessary for a game like this, it finally gives us a readout. We've got 10 points, and we got 10,000 credits in the bank, and we've also got first place it appears on all of the championship tables. So that's good news at this point. Now we move on to the second race in Australia. It tells you everything about it, but the most important thing is to spend that 10,000. So now it's time to move on to the highly convoluted upgrade system. And you can see rather than a massive, huge, great graphics engine, it shows you exactly what you've got and a readout of some info. So it really feels like you've got your hands on this equipment. No, it gives us tiny little equipment and the image in the left corner actually shows us what we've got and the images on the right shows us what we could have and so it's a matter of lining those up by buying them and so we've just spent all of this on a new gearbox. After some more long loading we get on to that second level. Here things continue from where they left off and you can see that the road is very smooth, not as smooth as a vector based game like No Second Prize or even Vroom, but it does shift along and hopefully with No 20 you can see that we can also jump into the air as well, just like Lotus 2 when you hit logs you'll jump into the air. So the most important thing in this game is to have a great start and then you can catch up hopefully to that first position. You might have noticed we completely ran by an N on the road that gives us even more nitros and so even though for some reason I'm saving nitros on this particular level definitely if you can pick those up during the level it gives us an extra one for free. And I think you can only pick one of those things up, and once you pick those tokens up, that's it, disappeared. So this isn't quite Mario Kart, but it does give us collectibles as we go around. Not many, unfortunately, it really needs a front missile to be a fun game, but it doesn't, but it does give us lots of nitros. So let's put our foot down, and hopefully third, second now, hopefully let's catch up to that first place position driver. As we're driving along it gives us two sets of music and those two sets of music will play alternately on different levels so you'll get one set and then on the next level it's another one and it's not as good as other racing games that give us maybe four or five different sets of music alternatively and definitely burning rubber gave us more sets of music than this and Lotus 2 didn't give us anything so at least we do get 
an in-game soundtrack. Again, we move on to another course, it's a night course this time. And unfortunately you can't buy any fog lamps or anything that can help us at night. And so we've got another first place, that's another 10,000. What can we buy with that? Side armor, or we can buy ourselves some more nitrals, we can actually afford that. And all that will do is maybe give us one more mark of nitrile that we can use for free at the beginning of every level. And certainly on this amateur mode that we're playing at the moment, it's ridiculously easy. So we don't really need to bother much about all these upgrades, we just need to use up the turbos at the very start of every level. You can see we can buy wet tyres and dry tyres, so let's buy some wet tyres as well, just in case this happens to be rainy, and that really should have paid more attention to the instruction screen. Top Gear 1 originally came out for the Super Nintendo machine in 1992 and that's another Lotus rip-off game. This game was coded, or at least converted, by Mike Chilton who started out on the Amiga with Strikes for Cyclops in 1990 and that was a very poorly received game, it really got an average score of 44% on the Lemon Amiga website. We then moved on to Barbarian 2 for Signosis and that came out in 91 and that got 65%. Moving now into Australia we can see that it is now a wet race and now we've got even more money to spend and definitely I really want to be saving up the cash at this point in order to buy ourselves a better engine. And do we get the maximum wet tyres? Or do we spend that cash on something else? Well, looks like we're buying dry tyres at the moment, let's go through the wet ones and hopefully the maximum wet ones and you can see various differences will appear on the graphic of the item we've actually got and that's pretty mysterious but it just means that we've now got the best tyres so we don't need to afford any more tyres we've got the gearbox and the turbo so hopefully now the engine is the only thing that we really need to save up for so hopefully that's what I'll be doing from now on Round Horizons, you can see we're drawn by Bernie Hill, who also created Hate for Gremlin in 1997, and the graphics, at least the car itself, was drawn by Paul Gregory, who you remember created the graphics for Venus the Flytrap, and also Switchblade 2 for Gremlin, which we've reviewed already. And the music, of course, was Patrick Phelan, who, amongst other things, created the music for Lotus 3. Hero Quest 2, also Nigel Mansell's World Championship, Zool and Zool 2. On this race we get some water effects and also some lightning in the background. That doesn't change the car dynamics one little bit and there isn't even puddles on the road like Lotus 2 or Lotus 3 so wet weather driving really doesn't make any difference to the handling of the car with the best tyres on so you really won't notice any difference it doesn't really affect your visibility either so this is yet again another pointless demo like effect and it's not actually as good as the weather effect in Lotus 2. It's 
also a pretty surprising weather effect that we get. A rainstorm here in Australia of all places, Sydney Harbour Bridge and everything else is there. But maybe in the south of the country it rains a bit more than the north of it. I'm not quite sure, but you would have thought that a windstorm would have been more appropriate for Australia, with maybe a bit of tumbleweed blowing around and some pretty dry barren areas. But I'm not quite sure. I think this is the final course in Australia. It gives us some barriers in the road as well, again, just like lotus, and some very nice stunted trees, which look like banzai trees, but they aren't that big, unfortunately and the graphics of the Amiga you could draw sprites a certain width but you could draw them any height so why we've got small trees I've no idea. You can see on this particular course that we are lapping we're in second but first place is miles and miles away and i think in some courses it just gives you maybe you versus a competitor and all you have to do is to catch up to that one competitor and you can see where we are at the moment is miles and miles away so even if we use up all the turbos at this point we're not actually going to have enough speed in order to catch up and you can see we're now using a 5 speed automatic gearbox, Your know, top speed is 109 and that's not really enough so maybe I definitely recommend spending more money on the engines at this early stage and that gets us through those races I think if we make it in the top 3 we get to qualify for the next one and that's not too difficult and then look at that it gives us a password that's almost impossible to write down loads of symbols and texts and all these things and if you remember from Lotus those were very much more simplified. Now we finally move on to a new location, it's Britain, it's Loch Ness. So in Loch Ness what do we need? A great big engine is what we need and we can't afford that right now so let's skip on to that next level. In Britain it's turned up the fog effect all the way up to 11 so that you can only just see in front and it's a white out and that again doesn't really affect us because it gives us still plenty of time to see those competitors. So we really don't need to watch out for the map and these corners aren't difficult either. And yet yeah, we've managed to get our speed up that puts us up to 111 miles per hour and that will slowly wear down so that gives us a couple extra. So, yeah, we do get a few tokens to pick up on the road, as well as extra money it seems as well, so it's definitely worth driving in the middle of the road and picking them up. Unfortunately at this stage the roads are very easy, and as far as I know the roads don't get difficult throughout this entire game, so at this stage the player will be having fun, but it's not too much fun because the roads aren't too difficult to handle. Unfortunately it takes it easy on the player in amateur mode and maybe in the more professional modes the other races simply go faster. So I'm not quite sure, let's skip on to the end of that and you can see what I managed to meet at the end of the race in first position. Now in London, but we still can't afford the engine upgrade, we've got the best tyres and should we waste that money on an extra gear? Well I've already actually bought the second level key box and the next level is actually too expensive. So we're not going to do that, we're going to save up again and as soon as you upgrade one level of engine and that should take care of all of the other races. If 
you remember back in the day, nothing really happened much on the driving scene. On the Amiga pre-1990, we got the Crazy Cars series, and of course we've got Indy 500 as well, which was 10 years ahead of its time, that came out in 1989, and I think Formula 1 Grand Prix came out in 1991, so there was a bit of a gap there, and the quality of racing games really took a leap forward in 1990 when we got Lotus 1, and I remember having a Commodore 64 in 1990, and anybody who's played Lotus 1 on the Commodore 64 compared that to the Amiga version, definitely can see the reason why I nagged my mum to upgrade, and apart from that, at that point I didn't really want an Amiga, and I didn't really nag my mum, and she actually said, do you not want an Amiga for Christmas? 1990 and I said no I'm fine I've got my Commodore 64 why should I trade in a machine that's got tens of thousands of games for it for an Amiga that only has a few thousand games for it I'm fine and then 1991 rolled around and a friend of mine got the Amiga and so 1991 obviously Lotus 1 was out by then and we played Supercars 2 I think as well so I was very impressed with Lotus 1, the frame rate and the smoothness as well, and I soon discovered that if you played that in NTSC mode, and I didn't have a clue what NTSC mode was back in the day, but I managed to get a boot disc that put discs into NTSC mode, and when I played it, it played a lot quicker. So I definitely had fun playing Lotus 1 when I finally did get my Amiga, which I think was Christmas 1992. So by that stage, that was almost all over for Commodore, and I could have got an Amiga 1200 by then, and I almost got an Amiga 500 Plus, but definitely when I got my Amiga, the Lotus series was games that I enjoyed playing, and Lotus 2 came out, I definitely had a copy of that. And Lotus 2, again, had great, memorable passwords that you could type in, like Ebo and Peaches and Liverpool and if you wanted to you could just skip straight to the fog level and have a bash of that or the rain level or the desert level or whichever level you wanted to play you could just type in that password and it was like a mini game all to itself you could just have a bash and then you could get turbo zones and extra time and box set go with all these voice speech sound effects and I couldn't help but be impressed and back in the day I thought that it was even a full screen game but Sean Southern in interviews said that he coded the game in 640 times 200 which was double to 400 and he said he tried it on 512 but unfortunately it made the games too slow so he coded them in NGSC compatible mode and that's why a lot of the series unfortunately are in NTSC compatible and that's because they wanted to keep the frame rate up and I really don't blame him for that because on an ordinary Amiga 507 MHz machine really does struggle and I think he was trying to get 25 frames per second out of it and the Amiga 1200 should hopefully be able to get 25 frames per second out of it very easily indeed so a game such as this shouldn't need to suffer for those kind of mechanics but back in the day we managed to get another game released in 1992 that was Jaguar XJ220 and what happened was Ian Stewart who was the manager or at least the managing director of Gremlin Graphics and Gremlin Interactive gave the job to Core Design which used to be part of Gremlin but they split it off for tax reasons and now Core Design was given the job of creating a new Lotus so what they did was borrowed as much as they could from the original Lotus and the idea behind it was to create a competitor and the competitors would stimulate each other on the market and the good news was that both of the competitors were actually released by virtually the same company. So Core Design over there in Derby was responsible for JAG and that's why it borrowed heavily from Lotus 2, although in Stewart didn't bother telling Andrew Morris and Sean Southern that, and so that's why they noticed various things had been ripped off. 
and so when Lotus 3 came out, they made sure to copy back certain things that Jaguar had invented, like the tumbleweed and the wind blowing across the track and things like that. And they also incorporated as well the track designer. Remember Jaguar had a track designer, Lotus 3 had a track designer as well. And it wasn't as good, it was pretty rudimentary, but it did extend the life of the game so you could design whatever track you like on it. And that was a marvel for 1992. And you might remember Crazy Horse 3 also came out around that time to hopefully cash in on the same thing. And again, had really smooth graphics. It turned it up an extra notch with the turbo function and the turbo function in Crazy Cars 3 and the police as well really ramps up the atmosphere because you were driving on roads and they even released that twice. They released it as Lamborghini Turbo Challenge or whatever it was called, American Challenge, and it was the exact same game. So it was a competitor under a different name under the same banner, Titus, and that was released again to compete against itself. So, unbelievably, that's what went on on the Amiga. The past professional driving games were all trying to copy off each other, and apart from Burning Rubber, which came out in 1993, which was Ocean Software trying to cash in on the same technology with the same banded road and the same trees and same action and burning rubber you could use turbos for that not that i used any turbos on my review because you crash out and burning rubber is definitely a rad racer clone where you skid from one side the track to the other and when you crash out it really is bad news in this game just like lotus 2 well you do a spin in this game you don't see any sparks flying on the road and you don't get a spark sound effect either you just get a bash and you'll see the car spinning around on the spot and that slows us down and in Lotus 2 you could drive around and crash into the back of other cars and this one does the same but the penalty for doing that is greatly increased and if you do that then you'll find the driver in front of us will disappear off into that horizon so it's definitely worth avoiding all the other drivers and you might notice we haven't got much control over this car it handles pretty much like a boat and you can stick to the center of the road like glue without veering to the left and right with the corners that means you don't have to slow down for any of them either and that means you don't have to use the brakes at any point throughout this entire game and that means the brakes are relatively useless i remember in lotus one it was a good idea to use the brakes to get around some traffic and that was fantastic because that really put us into the action because we not only had to steer around things and accelerate but brake as well and so that really took the game to different heights and i'm not sure i don't think you had to do as much braking on lotus 3 but on this game as long as we are on the right side of the road for the corner we don't have to do any braking whatsoever so there are definitely differences in the games even though most people compare them like for like and you can see well this is an AGA game so it has better copper drone sky effects and copper is no problem and you can see well just like Vroom it has some 3D elements and they really haven't put the 3D elements to good use because if you remember in Boogie Boy we got 3D ramps and things that we could drive up and 3D elements in Vroom we got 3D stands and crowds and 3D pits that we could go into and 3D signs over the road that spanned the entire size of it and even in games like Hover Spirit or Hover Sprint whatever that was called you still got some kind of 3D effects. In this one you get sprite based effects and I think you get the start and stop flag which is 3D but that's about it. So the size of the road that you can see is pretty boring and it really doesn't do much except for when you're driving through it for the very first time. We know 
also be nice now that we're in Scotland see some ice on the road some snow patches that slows down some ice that skids us around some icicles on things and even in burning rubber we got to see icicles dangling off the signs and I think 1000 Melia as well and we got some very nice snow effects and we get a dabble of snow on knee-high bushes that you can see have appeared in Scotland we don't get any heather and we don't get anything that reminds us that we are in Scotland whatsoever and this could be Finland and yes maybe I should have broke there but I'm actually getting bored with this game now I actually get to the stage where I can't bother to turn the corners anymore and that's definitely one of the drawbacks that you face and if you lose concentration it's definitely easy to start crashing to the side of that road this game doesn't really give us a massive sense of achievement when we cross above that line because it really doesn't matter as long as we get through in the top sections we'll win the championship and again on this amateur mode this is complete waste of time because all of the drivers apart from the very first section of the game when we don't have any upgrades are very easy and that means that the player will get bored maybe on the professional mode and the championship mode that gives us a very good chance of sliding off a bit further and maybe this handles it better but this thing handles like a boat not quite on rails and unfortunately Lotus 1 definitely handled better than this and just like Lotus 1 we'll also have fuel to watch out for as well although I'm not quite sure what purpose that serves given the fact that we can't refuel on any of these levels and there is no pits either and you can't buy extra fuel tanks and so I think the fuel is simply there if we use up too many turbos if we use up too many turbos maybe we'll run out of fuel so that's one thing that definitely separates this from the Lotus games so you can see we still can't afford any better engines we're using the second engine I can definitely tell by that convoluted symbol system so that means that we get to move on it's another wet race and that means we can set off we're still using the five speed gearbox and hopefully we can now get some more top speed out of this so the first thing I do obviously is press that turbo button and you remember from Jaguar XJ220 when it gives us waterfalls which moved rapidly around the screen in real time and it gave us underground tunnel sections as well with stalagmites hanging down from those and then emerging out into another waterfall section which gives a breathtaking experience unfortunately this game doesn't give us anything like that and the background flashes occasionally and that's about it so none of the backgrounds move this isn't Street Fighter 2 they didn't even put any moving backgrounds in and it hasn't got anything flying in the air like Vroom either so this thing is a bare bones basic casting racing game and that's why almost all of the magazines commented on that and maybe if you play this in the hard difficulties it will give us a challenge definitely the amateur mode is an insult to humanity and that's basically a kid mode kid mode so let's move on to Canada and in Canada you can see we can now afford a better engine so let's move on to a third class engine it doesn't give us too many upgrades in fact precious few and we actually got a lot more upgrades on supercars 2 so they could have made a lot of difference in this game by incorporating different things port polishes and head cleaning and things like that and different exhausts all of which we got on burning rubber but we don't seem to have got them on this particular game and they make even less of a difference than we saw on burning rubber one of the 
the better aspects of the game is definitely the music and the jolly music is well it's better than some of the soundtracks that I've heard on some of these games but the fact that there is only two pieces of music kind of gets annoying after a while and there is no dual layer of parallax in the background either not like super hang on so even though the graphics are well drawn you would expect a separate layer of hills at least and never even bothered to do that so compared to other games this definitely is the most basic game they could have ever coded. game couldn't get any worse it's a night course and it's not really a night course because it's supposed to be lightning in the background I've never actually seen so much lightning and we can't hear the thunder either and we don't get any sparks or cracks or zigzaggy lines on the horizon so it's lightning without any actual lightning so I'm not quite sure but all it does really is give me a headache so if you have epilepsy or even if you are susceptible to strobe lighting then this game doesn't improve things it simply makes things a bit worse so this isn't a difficult course again it's not like the night course in Lotus One where it gave us a massive long rally and you had to judge your fuel levels and you had not to bump any of the cars and you had to take it easy and all this that and the other no with this one you can just keep going to hell for leather you don't have to slow down for anything so definitely this game does take some liberties and on this level it can feel very very samey Finally moving on we get to go to Egypt, Abu Simbel, the weather is clear according to that and Egypt you can see an even plainer background and again no sand dunes in the road or anything like that, no wind effects which they could have done and virtually no effects whatsoever. So this game really does by the time you get to this stage demand to be turned off and that's really not what you really want from a top class AAA driving game and of course the cars are all drawn identically and some games that we've seen, Jaguar in particular had lots of different cars that we could race against and the Lotus had the Lotus license, Outrun had the Ferrari license so what does this have? It has a futuristic looking car with a shopping trolley wing on the back of it and that's what we get, it's kind of a Lotus ripoff and sometimes you have to wonder why they actually coded this game and I think it was released for $24.99 and you would think in 1994 uh, this point in time they could have released something a lot better I remember back in the day I rushed out to get Lotus 3 in the box, brand new in the box and that was definitely the art of playing a game on copy and then wanting to go out and buy the real thing, exactly the same happened to me with the Turrican games, I got the copies and then I got the boxes and pinball games as well got the original boxes and the Lotus of course I went and bought Lotus 3 victory on the day that came out and when I got it home I was disappointed because I was playing it on I think a stock 500 at that point and the graphics were really choppy and according to the guys they could have created a separate version for the 500 with smooth graphics and a smooth version for the 1200 and I think for Lotus 3 they optimised it for the 1200 and that meant the 500 experience was very choppy definitely the mountain level 
And of course you're getting mountains on this game. You got mountain level rip-offs in other games, but you don't get it on this one. So they hadn't even gone to the lengths of copying Lotus 2 in terms of quality. But Lotus 3, for me, was a disappointment because of that. And I definitely think that Lotus 3 was pushing the genre a little bit too far. But this one doesn't push the genre far enough. And so in times of 3D elements and crowds and flyovers and things like that and ducking and diving down hills and arcade games with huge great engines at the front of our screen pumping out fire, this really comes in as quite a lame duck. Now the upgrades, what can we afford? Well, it looks like we can afford another upgrade and again, I'm running out of things to say about this particular game and we're still using five speed gearbox but hopefully we've now got the best engine. So that should mean that we can get up to that top speed which is, I think in this game, around about 140, 150 miles per hour and it would help if I didn't keep crashing into the back of things like pinball and so you can see that we can get tons of money as well which is complete waste of time at this stage since we've got the best engine best gearbox so hopefully we've already afforded all the upgrades by the time we get here and so 124 miles per hour according to that which is faster than a train but if you're looking at this it feels a bit like we're driving about 85 maybe 90 100 so it doesn't really give us a sense of that top speed and definitely back in the day when I had a car it was possible to drive late at night on the highways in the UK as fast as the car could go and I had my car up to 125 on the journey all the way back coming from Glasgow when we sold the red hot chili peppers and that was like at 3 o'clock in the morning so it was possible to take cars up to top speeds and my family saloon managed to get up there at 125. The only reason why I couldn't take it any faster than that is because the tyres lost grip and the whole car felt too light at that speed and if you go any quicker then it loses adhesion onto the road. So that's how fast I ever took a car and when I was driving around I used to drive it like a maniac and I sold the car many many years ago now because now I live in a flat I don't really need a car but when I did drive a car I could drive it professionally and I was responsible finally when I stopped driving it like a maniac and then I started to chauffeur myself around because I figured if I'm going to get canned with the car insurance every time I crash it what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to chauffeur myself around and I'm going to be nice and smooth on the gears nice and smooth on the pedals, stop without feeling any motion stop whatsoever, set off, glide out of traffic lights as smooth as possible. And do you know what? I discovered that that maintained the car heaps more and by making sure that there's plenty of oil in that thing and it's kept tip top condition by driving it smoothly I could watch out for people coming out of side lanes without having to slam on and that was beneficial on the motorway and by taking my time I wasn't getting angry anymore and I didn't get road rage anymore and by chauffeuring myself around I realised that I was taking good care of the car more and that meant it didn't break down and I never actually had a breakdown in all the years that I was driving them so a family saloon can get up to 120 miles per hour even back in the day and so this is supposed to be a sports car now upgraded the engine four times, we've upgraded the gearbox four times and we've upgraded everything four times, the nitro and everything else so you would expect at this point it's as fast as fast as can go but it isn't so unfortunately it really is a bit of a letdown so let's move on to the scores and the lowest score went to Amiga Concept who awarded this 53% Mega Power gave this 63%, saying it was basically a Lotus ripoff, and Amiga Joker gave this 69. The Lemon Amiga score currently is 69%. A 
Amiga User International gave this 70, Siu Amiga awarded this generously 71%, the one who always gives everything above 70% gave this 74, and CD32 Gamer awards everything over 70% because it managed to get onto the CD32, they gave the CD32 edition, the DJ version, 75% which gives this averagely around about 6.7 rounding up to 7 out of 10 so this doesn't get an amazing score and Amiga Concept basically gave it a first score half 5 out of 10 I'd probably give that a 6 out of 10 knowing that the harder modes are probably more interesting but at the same time the courses aren't interesting the music gets repetitive, the sound effects aren't great, the graphics are well drawn but the few and far between, even Power Drift had lots more graphics on the screen than this and that would have been really great on the old 20. So they could have actually made a great effort but unfortunately they didn't. So that's why many commenters who played this game said it was an unfortunate opportunity and this isn't by far anywhere near the worst Lotus ripoff on the Amiga. There were Polish racing game conversions which were a lot worse than this and definitely City Cars is another Lotus 2 ripoff which is a public domain game. So it's not the worst game in the actual world but it's not actually so fun that you want to play it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave the review there and I'm going to switch the computer off. So thank you once again for watching Lemon Amiga Play Guide and Review and I hope to see you again in another Play Guide at some point sometime soon. Thank you. Thank you.